I say leadership is about gathering people who will have to go through transformation in order to accomplish a mission. Welcome to Living Life Juicy, the uh, YouTube channel and podcast where we explore what it means to be present and kind as we do great things. And today I have the great privilege of speaking with an old friend uh, about an amazing new book he has out and also other things. Todd Bolsinger is currently at Fuller uh, Theological Seminary as a VP for leadership formation, among a lot of other things. He's also uh, an associate professor and uh, not only teaches, but also creates an environment where a, a number of different types of people can join in and truly go through a process of formation and not an event. So Todd has a history in leadership. He started when he was very young in uh, big responsibility roles. Uh, he's moved through as a, as a pastor. He's led nonprofit organizations and now currently is in higher education. So I wanna welcome Todd to Living Life Juicy. Todd, glad you could be here. My pleasure, John. Thanks for having me. So now do you prefer Todd Dr. Bolsinger or Father Nature? <laughs> Good point. Um, Todd is fine. <laughs> Todd is fine. Even yeah. so, we I, I bring that up because Todd and I first met back in 1984, 1985, working at a summer camp, where he was he had the role of Father Nature with not a lot of natural history background. He was a he was a theology student, and I was a wrangler who didn't ride horses. And so we were at a camp and uh, uh, worked for an amazing guy named Dave Hopkins at a place called Forest Home, the Lost Creek Ranch. And that's how we first met. And I've, I've been able to follow Todd through his various ministry adventures from that point on. Mm -hmm. So Todd, just real quick, can you tell me a little bit about what polar bears have to do with you courting your wife? <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's the very funny story. So um, we used to do the thing with kids called the polar bear swim, where they had to get up early in the morning and go swimming in the lake. And, you know, the truth of the matter is it wasn't that cold, but they were from California, so they were wimps. But my uh, the woman that I was dating at the time was up uh, was at the camp next to the lake. So I used to make the kids uh, say nice things to her so I could I could flatter her. And it worked because we've now been married 32 years. So we're, we're doing okay. Didn't you say that the polar bear's name was Beth? And so they had yeah. to say good morning to the and polar they had to bear. Say good morning. morning really nicely to the polar bear who's named Beth. Yeah. <laughs> so I know you, you and Beth have been married for a while. And she's a pretty talented artist. Yeah, she, actually, she's the polymath of the family. She's marriage and family therapist, executive coach, artist. Um, yeah, the, she's the kind one, the, the one everybody wants to talk to and meet. And know. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? I mean, how has it been when you're married to especially the artist type, because there's some overlap in the counseling and the consulting stuff, coaching. But what about the artistic part? What, how does being married to an artist influence what you do? It's a great question. You know, um, she has taught me a lot about seeing and a lot of my work in leadership is about teaching people how to observe and see bigger things. And she's taught me a lot about the way that, um, we don't see what we think we see. We see what we, we make up what we see, right? So, you know, she, she once tried to make, make me draw something and she said, you're not drawing what you're seeing. You're drawing what you think a chair is. Like, yeah. like draw what you see. So, um, so I've learned a lot from her about that. that, that. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, big, the biggest part of what I do is, is, is I support her as an artist by making her dinner every night. So, so, so I'm the morning person, I get up, uh, write and meet with people. She gets up late and she works in the afternoon and I make dinner. So, yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like where, where I'm at. My wife is a, uh, she does uh, custom cookies and cakes and an event planner. So she's up until midnight baking and creating things and all that. And I'm up at four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, getting everything ready to go in the day and all that kind of stuff. So it's amazing how that works out. It, it creates kind of a good balance. Uh, but just don't 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 talk to her in the morning, and she can't talk to me past ten o'clock. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, tell me this: um, Did working at camp influence how you do your job today? Is there any connection to what you gained in the experience from working at a camp 
if you can remember that far back. I don't know. We're both kind of getting up there. Well, what's interesting is uh, just this last week, the, this month, I've twice spoken to um, a big national organization, their campaign ministry. And I was very, very aware that um, I was thinking a lot about the days of camping and what camping does. And camping did two things. Number one is camping gets you, gives you responsibilities at a pretty young age. You said that, like all of a sudden we are, we're not, we were not only responsible for a lot of kids and programs and policies and stuff that you had to do. Um, so it gave me responsibility at a young age, which I think makes me more inclined to trust and want to develop younger staff. That is one of the biggest parts that came out of camping. Um, that I that I got then. The, the second part is that camping is really about the experience. If you just think about it, you know, we used to say all the time, you know, this is their only week at camp this summer. It might be, we might have 11 and we might be on week number seven and we're tired of it all, but this is their only week. And so very, very often, even sitting on a Zoom call and stuff, you know, we were talking about the fact that we live on Zooms. I, I've done, um, I've done something like nine Zoom podcasts and webinars this week, and I've done several things. I've done, I did four yesterday, right? So, but it's the only time I have to interact with these people. So it makes me very focused on the notion of stay very present to the event, stay very present to the thing you're doing, because that, that that's, you're there to serve. Now, what would, we talked about the youth aspect of this. <clears throat> what would you consider your first leadership role? Uh, when you when you when you think back about your history, what was your first leadership role? Well, you know it's interesting because now uh, I you know I now have been as a professor of leadership and writing on leadership. I think of leadership differently than I did. You know, you, when you grow when you're growing up, you think of leadership as when you're um, given a title. You know, you're the uh, captain of the wrestling team. You're the uh, which I was. You're the you know the I don't know, sergeant in arms and your student class, student body president or something. Um, and you think about his titles. Now, I actually think of leadership really is about functioning. Leadership, I say leadership is about gathering people who will have to go through transformation or in order to accomplish a mission. And when I think about that experience, um, you know, that experience happened really informally in lots of ways. So if you're trying to accomplish a goal and you gather people together and say, we're going to do this, and we're going to get this thing done. And, and I think my earliest experiences of that would have been in like elementary school, you know, like we're going to take on this project, we're going to be different because we do it, and we're going to get it done. Um, that was probably an early on experience. Um, so I, I mean, the, in, in formal ways, a leadership came to me because of doing youth ministry really early. Like by the time I was in high school, I was on the leadership team. I was always on the leadership team. I was always, um, I mean, when I was 19, I was, I was, you know, working at camps and speaking and doing stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, do you ever try and when you're working coaching with leaders and executives, do you ever try and get them to think about their early leadership experiences uh, not the formal ones, but get them to think in terms of when you were on a project team or, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, do you ever get them to tap into those experiences to help them better understand their current role? Not as much as I'm going to. That's, that's a really good question. Like, I think, I think I need to think more about that. I, um, it's interesting. I spend more time helping people think through their family of origin than their early leadership experiences, because my experience has been that a lot of the, of the energy positive and negative about um, what drives a leader it has as much to do with their relationships and particularly their family of origin relationships. So, um, so it's, it, that's, that's where I usually go when I go back. Um, now that makes me think there's another kind of tool in the toolbox. So that's helpful. Well, I, I think in terms of, so I, I'll do something called story coaching, where if you think of your, if your memory is like a film and we, I mean, research proves how bad our memories are uh, as far as accurately depicting what happened back then. So we have these events that happen in our life. And for some reason, parts of it stick in our brain like a film, but it's an unedited film. And so I encourage people to go back and take a look at that event and what footage is on the ground. Don't make stuff up, but there's other parts of that experience that you've left behind. And can you re-edit your film so that it's more functional for you today? And I would imagine that asking people about those, think about a time when, like, the, I love the way that you define leadership as, as garnering the people, a group of people together to move forward past and through change and asking people to think back 
on those events in their childhood and even in their early careers. Um, Cause it'll change the model that they have. Like who do they look to as leaders? It's not the boss. It's that person that helped, helped you help guide you through change. Yeah. No, so, I think it's really helpful. I think that's a great analogy. I think that's really great. I'd, I'd use that. <laughs> Feel free. Um, I want to make sure that we get to this, though, and spend a lot of our time talking about I'm sharing uh, the Tempered Resilience screen right now. This is a book that you just came out with. Uh, with it just like three weeks ago, it hit the uh, early yeah, November, it hit the first book of yours that I read. I know you had some others beforehand, but Canoeing the Mountains spoke to me because I spent a lot of time guiding in the backcountry back when my knees and arms still bent. Um, and it was such a marvelous metaphor uh, the journey of discovery and running out a river and having to change the way that you lead. How do you lead off the map? Such a powerful metaphor. And I love where you, where you took that. Tempered resilience uses blacksmithing and also like the life of Moses and Martin Luther King. But that metaphor of blacksmithing, as I've read through the book, I love how surprisingly different you take some of the words. I would have never thought of heating as reflection but it's so perfect in that. And I wonder whose idea was it to go to the blacksmithing uh, workshops and, and training? Was it yours or Beth's? Well, it actually it was mine, but she, she was more excited about it than I was. Um, we, we first saw blacksmiths together when we were on a, a trip in Prague, Czech Republic in, oh man, like five years into our marriage. So it must've been the early mid nineties. And um, we saw these blacksmiths and a couple of times in my past, I used that as an analogy that I used when I was speaking. And it kind of came back to me because I was, because I was trying to think about a way of talking about um, how do you actually create tools that can deal with resilient resistance. And so I, I'd, I'd read um, the, the famous Martin Luther King Jr. speech, the I have a dream speech where he's got this great phrase about with this faith, we'll be able to hew out of a mountain of despair, stones of hope. And I love the verb hew. I just love that notion. And he, and in that, in that stanza, it's we'll be able to hew out of a mountain of despair, stones of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a brother, a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. And powerful, I'm, just individual powerful words in that. Yeah. Um, is hewing? Did you have to like mo move that? Because is that really part of the blacksmithing process, or is it part of the use of the tool? Um, you make the tool so that you can hew. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Do you ask what, how do you make a tool that can hew? How do you make it? It's like, if you're not going to uh, sledgehammer through a mountain of despair, think of a granite mountain, you're not going to blow it up and you're not going to cower in front of it. And your goal is actually to transform despair into hope. That was the entire metaphor. So how do you, what kind of tools can hew? And the answer is tempered tools, tools that are both strong and flexible. And that, and so, so it got me thinking about blacksmiths and it made me take a blacksmithing class. There's an urban blacksmithing community in Los Angeles, um, one neighborhood that probably hasn't had a horse in a hundred years, but they got blacksmiths there. And, um, and I took a blacksmithing class. I did it, did it a couple of times and um, just was learning about it because so that I could go through the experience. And I realized this kind of um, almost violent, um, painful, dangerous experience is what many leaders experience about their own formation. So that's what I started. Yeah. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about it is starting off with, uh, I, I love, and I'll probably butcher this, but where you, you go out, you're speaking all about uh, canoeing the mountains and there's such great tools and skills and competencies that you talk about there. But when you'd go out and speak, people would come back and say, yeah, that's great. But I don't know of anybody, any of our leaders who can do that, not because they don't have the competency, but because they, they don't have the energy, they don't have the, the fortitude to face the resistance they're going to take. It reminds me of uh, M. Scott Peck's opening sentence in Different Drummer, which is, life is difficult. And I think not a lot of people get the message that leadership is difficult. Um, and not in the way that it's just, it's, it's challenging your competencies and skills but it's really challenging your uh, ability to endure. Yes, yeah, that's exactly it. That's why, that's how, that's how I ended up writing about it. Yeah. So um, what, I, I love the metaphor of that this is, I mean, what more timely message is that uh, hewing 
Mountains of Despair into Hope. Um, how is it that you help attach that to the leadership's role? Because a lot of corporate leaders, a lot of people, even, even in ministry, it's about getting stuff done. Leaders get stuff done. But this seems to be more about how do you get through the resistance, the sabotage to hope, through despair to hope, and not just get stuff done? Well, the book is a formation book. So the, what it basically points to is that uh, resilience is not something that you can just um, grit your teeth and make it done. Actually, the, the most famous book on resilience is a book called Grit. And I love the book, but except that what mi gets missed is that book is making an argument that grit is more important than talent. Amen. I would agree. The problem is it doesn't tell us a lot about how to develop that kind of grittiness, that formation. There's some, I mean, I think yeah. I, I think Angela Duckworth did an amazing job and I, but what I wanted to pay, pay attention to was the most difficult thing for most leaders is dealing with internal resistance. It's completely, it's soul sucking. It's way harder than the external challenges you face. It's, and so when you are facing an external challenge and you are trying to mobilize a group of people to face that challenge and then they get resistant, is when leaders get completely demoralized. And that, and there's a kind of grit and resilience that needs to be happened at that moment. So the answer to that was, it is what is formed. You know, leaders are formed in the leading and there's a process of reflection and relationships and practices in a rhythm of leading and not leading that enables people to be formed. And then, um, and then there's a, there is a chapter on what I call hewing, which is the actual work of putting the tool to good work. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Duckworth, do you, cause I connect a, a, a grit with uh, growth mindset stuff right. with Carol Dweck. Um, so they kind of take it from a social science perspective. And then there's another book um, by Eric Greitens called Resilience that takes it more from a, philo a philosophical standpoint. For the you know, I'm reading about this, and he's pulling in the Stoic philosophers and all this kind of stuff in a very brilliant way, which creates a whole different um, case for resilience. So, how do you like? You've got the social science piece, you've got the philosophy piece, and then you bring in the theological standpoint. How do those mingle? Uh, how do I, I know you do quote a lot of the social science stuff? So, well, I basically I, um, the book is. It looked, I looked at two different sets of literature and I had my own experience working with leaders. So in the Venn diagram, it is um, spiritual formation literature. So how do people, how are people formed to have uh, what spiritually is called endurance, right? Um, Hupomone, how, how do you, how, how do you develop the resilience and the, the perseverance to continue to endure? then the spirit, the leadership literature talks a lot about that, the whole concept of leadership development for the sake of resilience and for perseverance. And then I just spent a lot of my time with leaders themselves asking them what actually makes a difference and, and particularly what is it that makes it hard? Like what, when, when do you need perseverance? When do you need endurance? And that was, I think the biggest takeaway for this book was, for me was that when you're leading groups of people and they begin to resist your leadership, it makes an impact on the leader. Like this is where Ed Friedman talks about failures of nerve and I end up writing about where, which is where you collude with non-change. So where ultimately you decide to go with the leader, the group wants to be comfortable and you decide to make them comfortable instead of change. And so yeah. it's, 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 it's Moses dealing with the Israelites who kept wanting to go back to, to slavery. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, it's interesting because especially in a congregational setting, you want to ne definitely make sure that you are addressing the needs, express needs of the congregation. And if their express need is, we, we want to stay the same, even though we told you different. Yeah. Um, how, how do you develop the confidence that you're continuing, even though it's painful for you, it's painful for the congregation, it's painful for your advocates and your enemies. How do you know that you're still on the right track? Well, for one thing, pain isn't the isn't the measure. <laughs> um, mission is the measure. So you, you I mean, in one sense, you, you want to be really clear on why you're doing something and what you're doing about. So if you know, if the answer is we want to confront injustice in our community, 
yeah, it's going to get hard. It's going to get really hard. So you should name that and nav so you can navigate that. Um, if you're trying to if you're trying to take turn an institution or an organization from an insular internal focus to actually caring about other people in the community, making an impact outside of its own self survival, that's hard. So so it's then it's normal it, to um, it, for it to be difficult, and it's normal to face resistance. And what I was also trying to say is it's normal then for it to make to take a toll on you. So Friedman talks about the failure of nerve and I talk about a failure of heart. I, I think that where you begin to get leaders begin to get cynical and disconnected. And, you know, my friend Jimmy Miato is the president of Compassion International. And he says, you know, the most dangerous thing about doing the work of God is it can undo God's work in you. And, um, and so it's paying attention to that. And so for me, resilience is also staying really open to your own ongoing transformation so that um, so you, you don't end up cynical and bitter and bri brittle, right? The opposite of tempered is not soft, it's brittle. It's where you, and that's one of the things that has to get worked out. Yeah, so that's, I, I love your, uh, you use the word holding. And again, a surprising metaphor because what it is, it's talking about your relationships as the anvil. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems like that right there if you're going to be tempered, you have to have a strong anvil to be hammered on. Yeah. And yeah. that that's what's going to keep you going is that is that support group and that the people who are with you while you're on stage and then the people who are with you when you're off stage and having those deep relationships. Um, how does a leader stay mindful of those different types of relationships? Uh, mostly by paying attention to the fact that you need them. I mean, most of our problems with most of most leaders through most um, statistics show that leaders expect it to be lonely. And we talk about the loneliness of leadership. And the truth of the matter is um, that's a, that's a dysfunction. You, you um, yes, your role might be a, a role where nobody else understands it exactly your way. But I always say that one of the most important things for leaders is to recognize that you are not meant to be alone, that, um, that, and, and that you can do this by yourself, but you will not be able to transform you in the way that you want. So yeah. the anvil, like, like steel on an anvil, you know, the more vulnerable you are, the more heat you experience, the more that it feels as if you are, um, and need to be are, are vulnerable and oozy like your mo molecules are falling apart because you're dealing with a difficult challenge the more you have that the more you need relationships and so paying attention to your need for relationships and making it normal that you need partners you need mentors you need friends you need all three all the time yeah well and and then it goes back to the the idea that you have before that which is heating and again surprising metaphor because you turn the concept of heating into self-reflection deep self-reflection and that 700 degree leader when the metal comes out uh, that's not hot enough you haven't spent enough time doing it then when you're put on the anvil um and you start hammering those relationships go and start to do more damage than good if you're not ready for that yeah yeah exactly right so um i'm curious about this now um so blacksmithing it's a craft, it's a, a trade. Uh, is there any connection when you're talking about leadership formation and kind of the apprenticeship process that you see in blacksmithing and other trades? I didn't write about it that way, but I think that's great. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's an interesting idea, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I pull that from you know working in corporate America and what they want is a course and a high stakes test that gets you certified. And what I prefer is more of a, a apprenticeship approach where, you know, yeah, you got to have the, you got to have the smart, you got to have the education, you got to have the information, but you've also got to have the experience and you've also got to demonstrate the skill sets. And that can only come through uh, what I call guided practice. Uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, they, you know, the 10,000 hours aren't any just 10,000 hours of any kind of experience. It's about, walking down with a group of people number one community you're part of a community and number two you're getting the important feedback in a safe uh, a safe manner where you can hear it from the people that you trust so um i'm you know i 
I came from this, I didn't come from this from a formation standpoint, but it seems like the process that you're talking about for creating um, tempered resilience and leadership uh, is, can be applied in many other places, not just leadership. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm, I'd like to know a little bit about, I know that you have a lot of experience in organizational development. I work more in the business world. You are, uh, I know you, when you wrote Canoeing the Mountains, you were in a process of deciding which direction you were going to go, whether you're going to take a VP position or go deeper into organizational development. What would tempered resilience look like if you had gone the organizational development route instead of the, uh, seminary route. How would it be different if you were writing it to a corporate audience? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, I can get, I, you know, it's really weird. Interesting. I end up speaking to corporate audiences because they say to me, hey, it wasn't written for me, but this works. So, so I go, okay, well then what I'll do is I'll get here and I'll, I will share what I know and let you be the expert about your world. And I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying, um, I'm not the expert of every world and, and I don't know every context. And I think context is often way more important than content. I think content is supposed to, can often conserve people in context. So, you know, um, I'm part of the Dupree Center for Leadership. I'm, I do the church leadership initiative. We have people who do marketplace work and they are experts of that. And we do a lot of conversations together, but I'm very aware of the fact that um, while I get asked to do some stuff in the business world, my, my main work is with nonprofits, educations, and churches. And so, um, so yeah, I, you'd have to tell me. <laughs> well, I'm curious, what are, the, what are the different questions that you get when you speak to the marketplace or corporate world versus when you uh, speak to church leadership? Well, adaptive change came out of the marketplace world. So, so mostly what I get is, hey, thank you for taking stuff that I've read on Harvard Business Review and, and telling my pastor about it so I can have a conversation with him about it. Um, and the same thing's true. So I, again, I'm comfortable in that world. I just, I don't think I'm the expert to talk about that. I think um, when I get asked, I say, here's what the research says. The, the biggest single, the single biggest piece that I get to say to people in the corporate world is, and this is a part that Peter Drucker talked a lot about, is that when you're in the nonprofit world, there is a an expectation for a value of deliverable that is more nebulous. The bottom line, Peter Drucker said, is they changed human life. That's harder. That's a harder metric. So today I was talking with a group of leaders from a national organization, and they were talking about you know, the only metrics that we tend to have are metrics of like numbers of engagement, people on our mailing list, people who come to our events. And I said, you know, the bigger challenge in a nonprofit world is thinking through what are the actual metrics that are going to be transformative. And so figuring out and discerning those metrics is part of the work that you have to do that is different than in uh, the business world. Now that's changing in the business world too. It's changing in the business world where you know, like you've got entire companies that didn't make a profit for 10 years um, because they had a different set of metrics. We're going to we're going to get market share over, you know, bottom line profits for a long time. So see Amazon. But um, but that idea of a changing set of metrics requires a kind of discernment and a kind of work and creativity that um, is really actually well known in the nonprofit world. Um, Jim Collins was one of the first people to talk about this. When he did uh, the social sector, um, his little monograph, he talked about the fact that, um, you know, that part of the engine of change is your economic engine. And that for a nonprofit, you have to rethink the economic engine in a totally different way. And, and that's true in my life. My world, my world is a combination. My economics is a combination of pe people pay me for services, they pay us for products, and they give money to us to fund our reach and our resource and our research beyond what people, uh, the people who can pay. I mean, if, if, if I just limit it to the people I could pay, who could pay, I would only be the wealthier. Um, and so, so even figuring out the economic engine, it's the same, I put it this way, it's the same challenges as the business world. It's just a different terrain it's a different environment you just gotta, yeah, it, yeah it sounds a lot like the old uh, balanced scorecard approach only you don't take the the defined uh four metrics that they use in a balanced scorecard and you say all right what are the metrics that the combination of metrics that are really going to help us stay healthy because it can't just be profit it just can't be market share 
it just can't be uh, employee loyalty. It can't just be customer service. It's got to be the things that you define as transformative for your company and your industry. And you've got the unique challenge, not necessarily unique, but you have, um, you have different customer bases and not all of them use your product. Does that make sense? Say more. Um, so you've got the people, you have the people who attend your university. Those are, I'd say those use your product. Those use what you're designing, all that kind of stuff. But you also have to tend to the donor base right. that have so, to believe in what you're doing, yeah. but don't use what you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah and I heard a lot of that when you were talking about the Dupree Center and the challenge that they faced, that they had a lot of people who loved them, but didn't believe in what they could do. Yeah, that was in the past history. You know, the, the, the big shift of the Dupree Center is that it went through a season where um, it had lost the credibility of some of its donors because they had good ideas, but they didn't deliver. And I think it's really one of the big changes that's happened in nonprofits is there is a lot more conversation about um, our return on investment <laughs> and like just a lot more. Um, it's not that it always was, but there used to be that people gave to charities because they just want, you know, you'd often hear people say stuff like if just one person's helped, it's enough. And now you got a lot of people going, no, unless you can scale this, it's not enough. Right. <laughs> so, oh um, gosh, I get in so like, cause return on investment is a financial term that gets you in trouble if you don't like, I can, I can do the equation, but the problem is when you're talking about changing lives, how do you uh, isolate impact and how do you monetize uh, when you talk about the stuff that nonprofits are doing? Um, it usually comes back to somebody on the C-suite saying, well, I think it's worth this much and I think it had this much impact. Um, or, you know, so return on investment uh, is a difficult, if, unless they already believe in you, it's a different conver difficult conversation to have once the accountants get in the room. But when you talk about, uh, you can define influence a little bit more uh, when you're talking about changing lives and you can say, this is what it'll look like if it happens. Um, do you have, I mean, is influence or uh, investment versus impact or influence? Is there, is that a, is that a difficult conversation? Do they translate? Is that uh, something that makes sense in your world? Yeah. Um, it's a both. It's a difficult conversation and it makes sense in our world. I mean, it depends on who's asking the question, right? So, um, and so, you know, every single time we put out a new product or a new service, like, so, so I do a lot of consulting and coaching. So the question we got to ask is, you know, this, this group can pay for our services. This other group couldn't. So can I convince donors that it's really important for us to have, make our services uh, uh, um, approachable and apprehendable by others. So we just got a million dollar grant from the Lilly Foundation to be able to scale our training and adaptive leadership online and then test it for its validity that, that literally your, our hypothesis is that we can do online the kind of training that you would do face-to-face -face, and we can actually do it with just as much um, effectiveness. I, I believe you can do that. And I've demonstrated that, in that educationally. And so now I wanna do that in training on adaptive leadership. And so we got a million dollar grant to, to, uh, to test that. And what people are looking for is that, like, is there a way to scale and develop? And, and, and that scale and develop language is not just about business, that's about impact. Like uh, churches who can't afford to, you know, pay my hourly rate or bring us in could afford to get really good training that we develop um, because some a, a foundation invested in us. Yeah. So what makes you so confident that you can get that kind of... Uh impact through the training you're, de you're developing? What's the, because there's a lot of people who throw up their hands and say, oh, if it's not in person, it's not going to work. What makes you so confident that it's, that what you're going to do is going to work? No significant difference.org. There's a, there's a website. It's called no significant uh -huh. org, And it's been studying online education and face-to-face -face education for, oh, years now and what it demonstrates is the difference is not in the modality the difference is in the, is in the teaching style so the reason why when people talk about zoom as a terrible classroom it's because you have a bunch of people who are trying to take the analog classroom and the face-to-face -face classroom and turn it over into zoom that's really different than online education as you know so it's it's like the, the example i often use is when they ver the very first 
motion pictures, very first movies, somebody just put a camera in front of a play. And they said, here we are, here's the play, here's the camera. Well, fast forward to Hamilton, where they put a camera in front of the play. But what they did is they put multiple cameras in multiple environments and they used the aesthetic of a filmmaker who learned that film is different than recording a play to create a really good version of the play. And so, so when you got Hamilton, I mean, what's, what's interesting about that is you've got an entire loop of innovation that starts with the earliest films that were just a camera in front of a play. And then people figured out movies are something different. They're really different. You can cut, you can edit, you can do different things with them, a different art form. Then they can come all the way back and they can actually do a different version of a filming in front of a play. And I think that's where we are in education. I think we're, I think we are only five minutes into what will be a hundred year revolution about using technology in education. And I think that because I work at a global school, we have had to work on this longer. And, you know, I'm a guy who has been a talking head my whole life. And I've had to figure out how to teach online, which is really harder than teaching in the classroom. But well, and I would I would say it's not it's it's different. And so if you if this is the, your first experience ever teaching and you hadn't taught for years and years in the classroom, it would be the same uh, uh, ramp up. And so pretty soon it's not going to it's not it's different. It's not harder or easier unless you have to unlearn habits and unlearn your approach. Yeah, which and is what which, which is back what to hard. Yeah. What was that? That's what made it hard. Yeah. And you think back to the days when people would say, oh, PowerPoint is horrible. You don't, you know, death by PowerPoint. And it's the thing is blaming PowerPoint for a bad educational experience is like blaming a hammer for building a crappy house. It's just a tool. And, and once you learn how to use the tool, it's that I'm working on right now, uh, how to avoid death by webinar. Because I think that people are so, when you hear webinar, you hear slide with maybe a little talking head up in the corner for as long as it takes. And I've been, since the, the uh, for the past seven, eight months, I've been working with experiential facilitators who threw up their hands and said, how do I do adventure program, challenge course, all this kind of stuff when we can't gather and we can't do it live. I showed them what uh, what Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams or WebEx, I just said, hey, here's what it's capable of. And they never knew that you could do all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden it, it hits their imagination going, hell, we could do, we could do so many other things. And where they walked into a workshop that I was leading saying, it'll never work. It's Eeyore, you know, this is all horrible. And they were, they were um, stressed out because they thought their livelihood was gone to, they walk out stressed out that there were so many options that they had to choose from that they, there was just a, a onslaught of possibility. And I think you, you hit it on the head that it's not the it's not the medium, it's it's not the tool. Blame the craftsman, uh, blame, blame the builder, not the tool. And uh, you know, to use another uh, another craftsman analogy, I'm not a great carpenter. So to me, there's maybe two or three different types of screwdrivers. But if you ask a master uh, in the trade, they'll tell you the 50, 60, 70 different types of screwdrivers, what they're used for, and when to use them, why. And I, I'm hoping that we get to that point in the virtual world where people who are both designing and delivering content uh, start to understand there's so much out there that you could be doing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as we kind of turn the corner here, I want to hear about, uh, I know you're just starting to get through this book. Do you already have something in your brain ramped up for as soon as you're done kind of moving tempered resilience? What's kind of next in your thinking uh, around anything? I mean, what's 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 coming down the uh, the pike for you? Um, I'm actually I'm writing a proposal for a book um, that we're, my agent is taking to a publisher in the next week, which is basically the way in which you develop you combine formational practices and adaptive capacity to develop the the people in your congregation, the people in your church, the people in your organization, people on your team. It's one thing to develop adaptive capacity in a leader. You have to figure out how to develop it within the organization. And so, so that will be the next, that'll be the next thing, probably the third book in the trilogy. And then we'll see if there's anything else I ever write ever again. Is this metaphor going to be wrapped around fly fishing or uh, Idaho somehow? I'm saving that for retirement. 
Well, Todd, I want to wrap things up here and um, thank you so much for giving up your time for this. I feel like my dozens of, uh, of watchers and listeners are just going to be so blessed by you uh, sharing your thoughts here. So thank you very much.